My name is John Baker. Uh, I started working in the cinema when I was 16 years old. Uh, first of all, I started with the cameras and uh, I worked with cameras for probably 30 years, uh, 30, 35 years. And one of the first people I met also working with the cameras in those days was a man called Kit West who later uh, turned or changed from uh, from being a cameraman to special effects mechanical special effects he was working at the time with a very well-known English special effects man called Les Bowie and uh, he to start with was doing uh, special effects but also doing camera work and I was still working with the cameras not always with Kit but whenever he needed a camera assistant he would call me and I would go and work with him doing the, or photographing, the special effects with, uh, for what he was working with, with Les Bowie. And uh, there finally came a day when the, the union, which was very strong in England in those days, came to him. I was actually working with him this day. And they said to him, look, um, you've got to decide what you want to do. You can't be doing the special effects or preparing all these special effects and then going behind the camera and photographing them. You've got to decide whether you're going to be a cameraman or a special effects man. So he thought about it for a while and then finally decided that he was going to be a special effects man. I changed to special effects and that picture was, uh, well the first one was uh, Indiana Jones, uh, that, that was the first of the Raiders of the Lost Ark pictures and uh, the second one was uh, Revenge of the Jedi the last of the first three Operation Star Wars Operation. films with, uh, with George Lucas. The the and then from then on it was the always impossible. always Men. special Men. effects Men. and Men. always Men. with uh, with my friend Kit West, hardly without exception. He and I worked together for something like 50 years or slightly more than 50 years. Well, working with these big directors, well, the only one who was really big is uh, Brian De Palma. He was a very fat man in those days. I think he's uh, slimmed down a little bit now. Uh, but no, uh, working with, uh, with these well-known directors, uh, it's always a great pleasure and an honor to get to know these people. Some of them are easier to get to know than others because they talk to you and talk to everybody on the crew. Whereas um, some of them uh, don't really talk directly to the people. One of these was uh, Brian De Palma. When, when we made the film Casualties of War in Thailand, uh, before the film started shooting, 
he, in the preparation, he was always talking with everybody. But once we started shooting, he wouldn't talk to anybody. On the set, he would only talk to his first assistant director and uh, he wouldn't talk <coughs> directly to the person concerned. He always used the first assistant to take a message to somebody or even if you'd be standing next to him like you and I, we're sitting next to each other and Brian De Palma's here and uh, myself or Kit West for example is here and his assistant director is you and he would say to his assistant director tell Kit West that I in the next shot I would prefer that he did uh, something a little bit different like this this that and the other and Kit would have to say to the assistant well yes we can change that uh, but we need to know exactly what change you want. And it was, <coughs> in this way, sometimes very difficult to uh, get to know exactly what he wanted. Uh, that's just one example. But uh, other directors like uh, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas would uh, always be very close and talk directly to the people concerned, which obviously makes life a lot easier for everybody. And if there's any problem, then you can sort it out a lot quicker, rather than just being told through a third person, well, he wants to do something different, so then you have to imagine what what that is and hope that one, whatever you do different is, uh, is what is wanted. That can be somewhat difficult. We as members of the crew and not with the artistic decoration department, we don't really have a lot to say in uh, where, where they shoot a film. But uh, from what I gather, the, uh, the art director and Steven Spielberg, they looked at many, many locations, not only in Spain, in other countries as well. But uh, during the course of the, the film and working and talking to people, they chose here. Uh, one particular thing, obviously, was for the for the sunrise and the sunset when you see this wonderful ball of fire floating up and down uh, to the earth and uh, that in in this particular location was absolutely amazing that was one thing and the other thing is uh, when they when you choose a location where you're filming uh, is not only for the the look of the land and where you can later build your sets you also have to think about uh, on a film there's something like 250 technicians working during the shooting and sometimes a lot more in the preparation building the sets and wherever you choose has to be near to somewhere where they've got hotels and places for for the people to sleep. It's not all, all, always possible to uh, to build a big camp to house the people for the months that they're working. There is, there's always these other things you have to think about. Yes, well, obviously in those days it was all mechanical effects. There was uh, hardly any uh, digital uh, things put on by the with the computers. Uh, well, apart from the from the ending with the with the arc, 
when all these things started whizzing around the place, uh, but most of it was, uh, was done for real. Uh, the, one of the most complicated was the, uh, the ball when it was rolling down with Harrison Ford running in front of it, trying to get out of the way of the ball. And uh, that was done for real in the studio in England. And uh, we had to control, because the ball had to be heavy so that it didn't bounce going going down the, the tunnel, so to speak. And uh, we controlled it with uh, two cables. There was a metal axle running through the center of the ball with a couple of bearings and uh, two wires, steel wires, attached to the bearings going back up to a, a big drum with hydraulic brakes. So you could control the speed of the ball if it happened to get too close to uh, to Harrison Ford, then you could slow it down a bit to give him time to get up speed and get away from the ball. But there was just in case anything went wrong, there was also a shallow, like a dip, that is not very apparent when you see the film, but it was deep enough for him to be able to to lay down and the ball could go over him without squashing him. So uh, that was a, an extremely complicated shot to do. But, uh, luckily all went well. The ball went well and Harrison Ford's still living. So it was, uh, it was, it was good fun, but a little bit nerve wracking whilst you're actually shooting it because in particular, when you're doing these sort of things with the with the real actor, it's uh, uh, well. Even if you've got a stunt man there, you have to be terribly careful because uh, stunt men are not expendable. You have to take care of them as well. So that was very complicated. That one. <laughs> I think it's lost a lot and uh, the biggest culprit of this are the very production companies because in order to make more money they have a team of people going around filming the making of the film and they put this in the cinema or on the television very often even before the film comes out so everybody can see exactly <coughs> how things are done. The cinema, I think, has completely lost the magic that it had many years ago when you didn't advertise <coughs> how things were done. It happened on the screen and it left people wondering how on earth did they do that? But nowadays, everybody knows. And I think it's a great shame. And uh, today, with the modern action films and with all the explosions and cars being blown up here and crashing into each other and uh, all the actors climb out of the car without a... Um, they might have a bit of dust on them, but they're, nothing happens to anybody. They're still walking around when it's completely unbelievable that anybody could, could get out of the wreck that they leave. And they do this all the time. But it's now what, what the public expect to see. There's lots of action. And it doesn't matter how they do it. No, as I was saying earlier, it's... Uh, it's lost so much of its magic because everybody knows how it's done with all these the making of 
which they put out before the picture even comes out, so the, to help the public see a little bit of what they can expect. But they show how everything's done, whereas in the, in the old days, one didn't do this. You, you don't get magicians that do these in, incredible disappearing acts on, on the stage, showing everybody how they do it. And I don't think they, that they should do it with the cinema either. Although now it's far too late. I think that's probably it. I, I, I'm not sure what else I can say about that because uh, <clears throat> it, it's gone. You know, the magic, the magic isn't there. You can get a watching a scene and it's all all happening even on the on the television <clears throat> when they show a film and you can get a five or six year old boy turn around and tell you how you did it because they've seen it in the making of it's a great shame now